Hello, my name is Brian Wallace. Uh, I'm one of the uh, law enforcement and military instructors here at SESI. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, a number of items that are uh, located in the bleeding aid control kits, which are soon to be placed around uh, Hartford Hospital and other properties, including the IOL, and what's in those kits. Um, the information we're going to talk about is based on uh, what we carry in the streets as far as law enforcement and the military. So some may be foreign, some of these items may be foreign uh, to you um, in the hospital, but are commonplace uh, in the field. Um, and others are something you probably use every day. So today we're going to cover uh, wound packing, and uh, we'll be using a wound packing trainer here. And two products we're going to be showing are standard rolled gauze and a hemostatic agent of Z-Medica's Quick Clock Combat Gauze, another product that's carried on the streets by both law enforcement and the military. The other product with wound packing would be some sort of a pressure dressing. And a pressure dressing is going to either be something like an ace bandage or an ace bandage basically with a pad sewn on it, which becomes an emergency trauma dressing. And we'll talk about the application for that and where that would be done. The second part of it will be a tourniquet application, what we call self-aid and buddy aid, and we're going to actually talk about how to place it onto an injured party or place it onto yourself uh, in that case if uh, you were injured uh, during a critical incident. Okay, to talk about uh, wound packing basically, um, there's a couple things you need to understand. Um, typically, if the injury is an arm or a leg due to a gunshot wound or a blast injury, we're going to tell you to probably place a tourniquet on it to control that bleeding if direct pressure isn't working and you can't maintain that pressure. Wound packing comes into play when we have an injury that is outside of where that tourniquet will be placed. So typically, anything in the shoulder, uh, up near the neck, this area, uh, as well as the groin, areas where the arteries will run closer, um, our areas are going to be wound packable. Um, we don't typically tell anybody to pack anything above the belly button or into the chest cavity for that matter. So this wound packer, we're going to say, is in the groin area. and. Um, We'll practice uh, packing a wound with that. So two types of products. Um, if you don't have a hemostatic agent, which is fine, um, regular gauze, rolled gauze is fine to use. Um, the way in the military we were taught was if you have a rolled section of gauze, you pull the gauze from the inside out and you actually start to feed it out from there. Now the way wound packing works is very, very simple. I always tell people to use their non-dominant hand and we would be wearing gloves if you had gloves uh, available. You want to wrap the front of your finger. And the reason why you wrap the front of your finger is inside the, uh, the wound channel, there may be jacketing from the round if it was a gunshot wound or fragmentation from an explosion, uh, an IED, something along those lines, along with bone fragments. So you want to protect the front of your finger. By taking that non-dominant finger, you're going to push it down as deep as you can press it towards where the artery is. That second hand is going to take the actual gauze, and that's going to start to push the gauze down and in and I'm going to try to maintain pressure with my non-dominant hand, the first one that went in, basically. And I'm going to keep feeding this product in, whatever it is that I have. We're going to keep doing that until we don't have any more room to pack. At that point, we want to take the rest of it, place it on top, and hold pressure. We need something that's going to do that for us. So by using either an emergency trauma dressing, which again is basically an ace bandage with a pad sewn onto it, or if you only have an ace bandage, that's fine too. So once, uh, once you have that pressure dressing in place, if you have two people, one person could be holding pressure on top of it. Um, the other person could be wrapping around the person, basically. Um, the first time around, I'll typically tell people, just pull it straight over. You want to put a little tension each time you pull this. And then the second time I would come around, what you can do with the product is throw a twist into it and that's going to start to tension down and force the product down into that wound channel. So as you come around, you're going to keep doing that and throwing a twist in it. Um, and at the end, basically you can tie it off, tape it off, however you can get this to maintain to hold this in there. So essentially that's wound packing with regular gauze. Now, with another product, a hemostatic agent like Quick Clots Combat Gauze, um, this is very similar to regular gauze. Um, it's impregnated with a uh, substance called kaolin, and what that does is it rapidly evacuates the water particles from the blood, and at the same time, you're also packing the wound and causing that tamponade effect to occur inside that wound channel. 
Um, this is what they call a Z-folded dressing, so it's accordion folded. In the same way, we would just feed this in. And it also has a marker in it so it can be seen under x-ray. Again, either product can be used for wound packing. It's whatever you have available. With combat gauze and most of the hemostatic agents that are available in the field, uh, cyto gauze, there's a couple others out there, um, they require a three to five minutes worth of pressure um, to start working and help to form a tenacious clot inside that wound. Um, but the pressure dressing is key, and especially if a casualty has to be um, uh, extracted from where they're at, picked up, carried, dragged during a critical incident, we don't want that to dislodge. One of the questions that comes up is does the you know, product have to be sterile? Um, do you have to have a sterile environment to use it? Those sort of things. No. Um, when these sort of things happen, obviously, uh, typically your patients are going to end up with antibiotics anyway afterwards, so we're not worried about having a sterile field or anything like that. This is in case of something huge happening at the hospital, a mass casualty, um, something as a critical incident, an active shooter, an IED bomb goes off, something along those lines. So we're, our big concern here is to stop the bleed um, and try to get that done in less than uh, four minutes. So um, we're not really worried about anything sterile. We can deal with the other problems afterwards. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about tourniquets quickly, and these are the typical tourniquets that we advocate uh, in the field. Um, I'm a full-time police officer and combat medic, also served in the armed forces and was deployed. Um, so I've used these in the past, and I continue to train officers how to use these. This is the CAT tourniquet, or combat application tourniquet made by North American Rescue Products. I have two variations of this tourniquet, and there's actually two different colors as well. So one thing important to understand is if you see a blue tourniquet, that is a trainer. That's not meant to be used on a patient, so it should be only be used for training. And that's something from the law enforcement world, all our training devices are typically blue. Um, the black tourniquet and the orange tourniquet are the two primary colors you're going to see in your kits. So they may be black or they may be orange. There's also a couple differences concerning these tourniquets. This is a CAT Generation 6 or below tourniquet, and this is a brand new CAT Gen 7. So anything about a year ago transitioned to this newer style. There's a couple differences we have to talk about with it, and they're very important when it comes to application uh, to a leg. So when you take these tourniquets um, in the kits, they're going to be what we call loaded and ready to go, basically if you had to put them on your own arm. So this is, again, a CAT Gen 6 or older. The, one of the differences you'll notice is the bar on this tourniquet, on the black one, is much skinnier than the Gen 7, which is a thicker bar. The back plate has been reinforced in the Gen 7. And then the buckle system, which is one of the most noticeable differences and performance-wise definitely uh, is, this is a double buckle system in the old version. And why that's important is if you're applying this to a leg, the manufacturer says you must go through that second buckle to create enough force to shut down the femoral artery. Keeping in mind the, the pressures of the femoral artery, it's not an easy artery to shut down, um, so it required that extra uh, buckle in it. So with the new generation, um, they have a single buckle system with a reinforced plate on the back as well. So that's really the only differences between the two tourniquets. They operate the same way. Um, so I will go over um, both tourniquets just so everybody understands uh, how they work. Okay, so one of the things about using a tourniquet, so it's important to understand this is an arterial tourniquet. Some people will see a blood draw tourniquet and say that's a tourniquet. The only tourniquets the military and law enforcement use are these style tourniquets. They're 1.5 inches wide um, and they're able to be put on uh, one-handed basically. So a lot of times people ask, well, how close do you place the tourniquet? So a textbook answer is two to three inches from the site, but here's the problem with that during certain uh, instances. So specifically with blast injuries where IEDs have gone off with fragmentation and shrapnel, that'll enter into a wound cavity and actually travel up higher into an area that you can't see. So therefore, I always tell people, if you're going to place a tourniquet, place it higher rather than closer to the injury site. The biggest concern is that artery will retract backwards and now start bleeding again behind where the tourniquet is. And then we're back to square one. So when an injury is severe as this, I would tell them to go High or die is what the military uses. So we would typically teach our guys to go all the way up high towards the shoulder, or we would come all the way up high towards the groin on the leg. It's also advised uh, with a tourniquet to use it on single bone application. So the humerus being a single bone and crushing that artery against it is much easier to do as opposed to trying to do it to a double bone application, an arm or a leg, and those arteries trying to close them both off. So typically we say single bone application is better 
Um, so humerus or femur, typically, to shut it off. OK, so again, this is a, a cat generation six. So this is an earlier model, but there are probably millions of these in the market, so you may encounter them. And again, they are in some of our buildings. I know downstairs for a fact that we do have some older models like this. I know the Institute of Living is going to be purchasing newer models, so it's um, likely that you will end up with the Cat Gen 7. So for ARM application, I kind of mentioned that you should uh, place it above uh, the injury site, minimum of two to three inches. Again, that's a textbook answer. I would probably go a bit higher, especially in a blast injury. Um, and we never place it onto a joint either because we can't, it's very difficult to compress, obviously, that joint and compress the artery in that area. So again, I'm just gonna talk about, this is the CAT Gen 6 or older models. This is a loaded tourniquet. So basically, it comes through the first buckle system closest to the windlass, the bar on it. It's gonna fold back on itself. This is the way the tourniquet is going to be in the package. So hopefully they're already taken out of the plastic. Um, the way your kits will probably be put together will be in some sort of little baggies inside of like a backpack or a larger kit. And there'll be a tourniquet and some hemostatic agent and some gloves and gauze and that sort of thing. So when you take the tourniquet out, it should be pretty well ready to go, as we call it in the field, loaded. The important part about this is that red tip that's on there, you want that, if you're placing this on yourself, because you've been injured, you want to make sure that red tip is towards your heart, towards the center of your body. This is very simple. This tourniquet goes over that arm that's injured. You're going to very easily grab the Velcro that's on here, pulling it tight, and you want to keep the windlass close to you. So as soon as you get most of the tension out of, of the Velcro, you're going to bring it back on itself about three quarters of the way around. At that point, you're going to access the windlass, and you're going to spin it. And people always ask, when do you stop spinning the windlass and lock it into one of the ears that's on here? So the answer is when the bleeding stops or there is no more radial pulse. And there's no radial pulse at this point. So um, the other question people often ask is how long can a tourniquet be placed? Well, the textbook answer is it can be placed for two hours plus before there's any damage to the limb. So we're obviously going to place a tourniquet if there's a possibility of somebody bleeding out um, as opposed to the damage that may occur if you leave a tourniquet on too long. Um, if this is taking place in a hospital, I'm hoping we have plenty of personnel around to reevaluate that tourniquet afterwards. But during the critical incident, if there's an active shooter or something like that, the most important thing is to get this on yourself and then get yourself extracted out of that area and or the patients. So again, once this is on and locked, the last thing you're going to do is you're going to take the rest of this material. You can come right through the middle there. And if it has a white bar or a little white piece of um, material that goes over the top, this one's missing that piece, um, it's not crucial or critical, but it will be on yours because it will be brand new and these are trainers and they've been abused. So this is what you're going to see and it says time right on it. So we recommend if you can write down what time the tourniquet was placed. That's helpful obviously for the docs uh, when they get to the trauma center to be further evaluated. But that's the way it's set. Again, the last thing you do is put that little bar over. Okay, so we covered the CAT Generation 6. That's the double buckle system again. And like I mentioned before, the, uh, the tourniquets that are in service are either going to be black or orange. Again, this is the blues or trainers, um, so they shouldn't be used. Or actually, you're made from a different composite plastic, so the company recommends you don't use it as, as a real tourniquet. So Generation 7, the brand new tourniquet. And again, this is likely the tourniquet you'll be uh, dealing with at the IOL. However, both tourniquets are in use. And if law enforcement shows up and throws a bag down and is helping to assist patients, you might be helping them as well. Um, you become a force multiplier at these scenes. Then that's why we want you to be familiar with both. So the Catch N7 loaded the same way. Again, a single buckle instead of the double buckle system. As I said before, there's that red tip. That's the important part. That one needs to go towards the center of the body if you're placing it on yourself. So again, the first thing I'm going to do with this tourniquet is I'm going to go over that injured extremity. I'm going to grab that red tip, and I'm going to pull it tight, just like I did the other one. And you want to get as much as that slack out, just as you did before. And this operates the exact same way the Gen 6 does. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to spin it down until I reach enough pressure that I have no more pulse or the bleeding is stopped. Once I'm sure that I've cut off blood flow, I'm going to pull the rest of this through here, get it out of the way, and I'll put the little white tab over, and then I'll mark a time. Again, if I'm applying it to myself, my goal is going to be to get myself out of the situation once I've controlled my bleed and to get out of the building, hopefully. Okay, so 
For a leg application, one of the very important things with these tourniquets is you want to take this tourniquet apart. Um, the reason why is if you yourself are injured and you're shot in the leg, uh, there's a high probability you're not going to be able to bend your leg and get this around it. Um, that becomes a training scar, so we tell people not to do that. So what we want to do is take the tourniquet apart, and again, this is the Generation 6, the older style with the double buckle. So we're going to take that tourniquet and we're going to put it around the leg. We're going to come through the inside buckle that's going to be closest to the actual windlass. And we're going to get as much as the tension uh, as we can on this, and we're going to come back through that second buckle. So that's a little bit tricky at times. Um, these tourniquets have been used quite a bit in training, and you want to get this tension out, and that's why they're a little tougher than a brand new one out of the box, if you will. So I'm going to get the tension out, and I'm going to bring it back underneath itself, again, about three quarters of the way around. The other important part now is, when you grab the windlass, you want to grab on it and pull up and turn. And each time you do that, because what it tends to do is wants to bind into the pants or scrubs or whatever you're wearing, and it makes it difficult. So we're going to keep doing that and keep turning until what happens. Again, the bleeding stops or there's no more pulses. These hurt a lot more, obviously, to put on. You're probably not going to bear weight in this leg. You're probably going to have to drag yourself around a corner or have somebody help you at this point. Same thing, any excess, you're going to pull through the center. And if you have the little white tab, you're going to put that right over the top as well and mark the time on it. Similar situation again, Cat Generation 7, the newest version with the single buckle hole. Makes it a lot easier, obviously, to place. So again, we're going to take this tourniquet apart and we're going to go around and come through. And again, there's only one buckle hole. You can't get it through the second, buckle, the second opening. There is no second opening on this tourniquet. So it's very simple. You're going to pull it as tight as you can. Again, bring it back around three quarters of the way, like we said before. Access your windlass. Again, pull up on it each time and spin until the bleeding stops. You're going to lock it in place inside of one of the ears, pull the rest of the tourniquet and the excess through, and then that Time piece is going to go across the top, and you can go ahead and mark the time again at that point. I kind of made a mention about self-aid and buddy aid. This kind of got, now goes to a buddy aid if you're helping an injured coworker or a patient or whatever um, other than yourself. So if you're going to go on an arm with one of these tourniquets, um, one of the things you can do is just go right over the wrist, right over the arm, and come straight up it. Um, this is going to grab a little bit more because of the rubbery uh, mannequins we have. Um, on a person they slide much easier. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to tension this tourniquet down and get the slack out of it. And it doesn't matter uh, which way the running end of the tourniquet, whether you're going towards the heart or going away, because you're operating it and you're not trying to pull it into yourself and fight body mechanics. Um, you're applying it to somebody else. Um, and the same rules apply for this now. I'm going to pull up on the windlass and I'm going to turn it till basically the bleeding stops or I have no more pulse. Uh, on the actual patient. Again, the same thing, you're going to run this extra part of the tourniquet through and the white tab is going to go over the top and you can mark down your time on top of it. Okay, so for leg application on, again, buddy aid or a patient, um, again, the rules apply. You're going to take this tourniquet apart no matter which generation it is. Um, it doesn't matter which way you're going with it, um, but you're going to go around and obviously Again, these mannequins are a little bit more difficult because of the rubber and stuff like that. On a person, they move a little bit easier. So you want to come back through, and I'm going a little slower than I would in real life. You're going to go as fast as you can, obviously. And you're going to tension that down as much as you can and get the rest of the slack underneath it. Once you're uh, good with that, you're basically going to grab your windlass, and as I said before, you're going to pick up on it and turn, and that's going to go the same way. And we're going to keep doing this until the bleeding stops. So if this had a spurting artery, um, hopefully that would be uh, slowed down at that point. In the event that it's not stopping on a leg, a second tourniquet can be placed uh, just above the first one if you have room or just below if that's the only place you can place it. Um, so the same rules apply. Any extra will come through. Typically on the leg, you're not going to have too much extra left. Um, and then you're going to put your time right over the top and write down what time it was applied. So this has been a view of uh, the contents of a bleeding aid control kit, which would be placed throughout the hospital property and in the Institute of Living. This training uh, should be reviewed annually at a minimum or as needed. For any other further assistance uh, on the start of training, please contact SESI. Thank you very much.